Hi, I'm Dr. Scott Hahn, and I want to welcome you to the Word of the Lord, a production of the St. Paul Center. But I also want to say, Happy Easter. For today, we're going to reflect upon the Mass readings from Scripture for Easter Sunday. This liturgy is, of course, one of the most joyful in the whole church calendar as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first and second readings present us with early apostolic preaching based on the resurrection, and the gospel reading describes appearances of Christ to his followers immediately after his resurrection. Stay with us. This is the Word of the Lord. Hallelujah! Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And on this very special installment of the Word of the Lord, I'm joined once again by my friend and colleague, Dr. John Bergsma, Vice President for Biblical Theology here at the St. Paul Center. Welcome, John. It's great to be together. Yes, absolutely, Scott, especially on this celebration. It doesn't seem like we can do justice to everything that takes place in this 24-hour period with all these wonderful liturgies. Right. Uh, but it's worth taking a shot at it. <laughs> it sure is. I mean, it's the culmination of the Lenten journey. It's the climax of the Holy Week. It is the Paschal mystery. And so we have to recognize on the one hand, this is so profound. It is so deep. There is no way that we can exhaust it. On the other hand, you know, it's so accessible that we can really make a mark in our That's hearts true. and others too. Absolutely. So it's our custom to have you do a sort of overview. Why don't we do that again? Yes, so we're doing the, uh, the Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday Mass during the day readings, um, not the entire Easter <laughs> vigil, <laughs> which would be, be that, fun. that would be the three hour uh, yeah, uh, Easter special of uh, Word of the Lord. But uh, no, we're going to just focus on the Mass during the day. And we start off with Acts 10, a very famous uh, passage of Scripture. This is what we call the Gentile Pentecost. Uh, the passage that we're reading for this Mass is Peter's preaching on the occasion of going to the home of this, um, of this centurion, Cornelius, uh, who is going to be one of the first Gentiles uh, who receives the Holy Spirit without first having been circumcised. Right. So circumcision, of course, was the ritual mark of becoming a Jew. So these Gentiles are going to receive uh, the gospel without having made that conversion to Judaism. And so, of course, that's a momentous act that, that opens up the gospel to proclamation to Gentiles worldwide. Most of us meditating on the scripture, celebrating Easter this day, are in fact Gentiles. That's right. And so uh, this is a momentous occasion for us to recall this event from Acts. And Peter uh, essentially re recounts the kerygma. He recounts the basic gospel message of Christ's uh, life, ministry, passion, death, and uh, resurrection. And um, then he also uh, speaks of the apostles as witnesses to these events who ate and drank with the Lord after his resurrection. That connects to our Eucharistic celebration. Maybe we can come back and talk about that because it's a very significant phrase. Let's do that, yes. Yes, but for now, let's just take note of uh, Peter's uh, uh, authoritative preaching on this event um, months later after the resurrection, reflecting on these great events and opening up the gospel now to advance uh, into uh, the, uh, the, the Gentile world, shall we say. Then we have the psalm. The psalm is 118. One eight, psalm 118 is the Easter psalm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to use this throughout the Easter octave. It's got key lines in it. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, of course, referring to Christ himself. Um, we, maybe we can come back to that as well because it implies that the church is a temple built of stones and rich, rich ideas there that are also reflected in Paul's theology and the book of and the epistle to the Ephesians and so on. But for right now, let's just reflect on Psalm 118, which was the conclusion, as you well know, Scott, of the, the, uh, the great Hallel, the, um, or uh, we could call it also the Egyptian Hallel. This is a set of psalms from 113 through 118, which were recited in the course of the Passover celebration. 
So our Lord um, himself chanted this psalm along with the apostles in the upper room shortly before leaving the upper room and beginning the passion in the Garden of Gethsemane. As you have argued, they do not uh, drink the uh, final cup of the Passover in the upper room. They end the Passover celebration with this hymn, concluding with Psalm 118. So I always get uh, chills uh, up my spine, Scott, when I read 118 with the context in mind that Jesus was reciting this in the upper room before departing for Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. It takes on greater force, greater impact when we reflect on what's said there. It's very poignant in the context of him about to go out and uh, celebrate his death. It's also a Todah psalm, a Thanksgiving psalm. That's very rich. That's tied to the Eucharist, which is the great Todah. We can come back and talk about that. Great. Our second reading is Colossians 3, 1, and 1 through 4, um, a basic statement of the gospel from St. Paul. Uh, you have died, he says to the Christians, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, your life, appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. The function of this short reading from Colossians in today's Mass is to remind us that what our Lord experienced is going to be shared by us. We are going to have this experience likewise of experiencing death and then resurrection. This is our model. Um, there's other uh, richness in that little reading too, uh, but again, we can come back <laughs> to that as well. <laughs> yes. yes. And then finally, the gospel is John 20, 1 through 9. Uh, our Lord's resurrection, uh, I should, no, let me back up. We don't have his resurrection appearance first. Um, it's actually Mary Magdalene running to the tomb. Uh, while it's still dark, there's rich connections there with uh, the Song of Songs chapter 3, where the bride of the song runs out into the city at night searching for her beloved. We don't get the full account of Mary Magdalene. That would be in the successive verses that are skipped here. But uh, we can discuss that if we like. But uh, the main passage of our gospel is Peter and John running to the tomb. John uh, gets there first, like the mystics of the church, arriving at truth first. But then, as a humble and good son of the church, he waits for the magisterium, which is represented by Peter, who shows up later. And then Peter is allowed to go in first and authoritatively confirm that a miracle has taken place. John goes in, sees the grave clothes lying there. The text says that when he sees the grave clothes, he believes. And there's a reason for that. No grave robber would leave the grave clothes behind. No, he's going to sit there and unwrap the body when there's knocked out Roman soldiers sitting aside or going to come to at any moment. Uh, they're going to hurriedly grab the whole mess and get out of there. So the fact that the grave clothes have been left behind means that something supernatural has taken place. John intuits that and he comes to faith. And of course, his faith leads our faith. His faith precedes ours and draws our faith along. And he, together with Peter, give this authoritative witness that, yes, indeed, the tomb was empty. And so we have reason for our faith. It's not, as Kierkegaard and other thinkers have said, just a blind leap into the dark. Uh, we do make a leap of faith, but it's a leap based on evidence and based on witness, based on testimony that's trustworthy and worthy of credibility. So that's the message of the readings for this Easter day. Yeah, that's beautiful summary and mm -hmm. synthesis. Two observations I would like to make at this point of transition. First, the stark contrast between how sparse the readings are on Easter Sunday compared to how plentiful you have it on the Easter Vigil. You alluded to that, but if you were to include the responsorial Psalms, you have well over a dozen readings from the Old Testament and the New. Now, in many parishes, not all of them will be read. Really? I always prefer <laughs> all of them to be read. I remember back when I first came into the church back in 86, and uh, I just had no idea. Nobody had prepared me for the banquet that we would be served up in Monsignor Bruskowitz, now the retired Bishop of Lincoln, uh, spared no expense. It was not just a, a beautiful celebration. It was a beautiful explanation of how all of these scriptures were woven together in terms of promise and fulfillment. Yeah. But this is rather sparse, disproportionate. Perhaps it's, you know, giving consolation to those who stayed up so late the night before <laughs> you're coming and it won't be so hard to stay awake. But more to the point, I want to land on that last thing you said, and that is 
This is not a, a leap of faith that is a leap into the darkness. I mean, faith goes beyond reason, but it doesn't go against it. Yes. And so what you just indicated needs to be emphasized because even though John 20 verses 1 to 9 does not describe an actual encounter with the risen Savior, clearly it is setting the stage for the personal encounter between Mary Magdalene and our Lord, as well as our Lord and the apostles. But you have the testimony of Mary, and then the foot race to the tomb, and you have the first piece of remarkable evidence that the tomb is empty, and that the burial cloths are arranged in a way that thieves would never leave them. <laughs> it's laughable to think of that, uh -huh. you know, to picture that in your mind. But more to the point, we can see what I suppose Frank Morrison saw over 70 years ago. He was this famous lawyer, historian, who wanted to disprove the resurrection. And then, of course, he set out doing his research and changed his mind dramatically and wrote a famous book that's still in print, Who Moved the Stone? Right. Because on legal, evidentiary, historical grounds, there really isn't a reasonable explanation apart from the miracle of the resurrection. Indeed. So we have the historical event, the facticity, the historicity, the fact that there is an empty tomb. And then later after this gospel reading, we have the eyewitness accounts that Paul summarizes in the famous resurrection chapter known as 1 Corinthians 15. But we also have this sense that what is going on here is not just another minor miracle. You know, not that Lazarus being raised after four days was a minor miracle, it was stupendous. But this is not just Jesus' corpse being resuscitated like Lazarus' mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. This is a historical event. It is a supernatural miracle, but it is a sacred mystery as well. Yes. And I think that's really the cause of joy, that yeah. it isn't just like, oh, like Elijah and Elisha and Lazarus, you know, we have these bodily resurrections. No, this is the glorification of Jesus' humanity, but it's also the divinization of ours. Mm -hmm. And you know, you mentioned in passing that the reading in Colossians uh, is, is brief, like the others, right. just four verses. But it starts off in a rather surprising way. Brothers and sisters, if then you were raised with Christ. Mm -hmm. No, wait a minute, Paul. <laughs> Christ is raised and we hope to be raised. What are you implying? Well, he's not implying, he's explicitly stating that the resurrection of Jesus' physical body and then the gift of the Holy Spirit, as you mentioned, with the Gentile Pentecost mm -hmm. in Acts 10, this unites us, this fuses us as members of his mystical yeah. body, yeah. so that if he is raised and we're united with him through baptism, then we are raised, and it's not just a future hope, it is a sacred mystery, right. but it's real. Yeah. And all through these readings, uh, we have allusions to the sacraments. That's right. Because it's through baptism and it's through Eucharist that we participate in the death and the resurrection uh, of our Lord. So it, you, you mentioned the readings from Colossians, if then you were raised with Christ. Well, when were we raised with Christ? Well, we were raised out of the water. Right. Uh, it's like Romans 6. Do you not know that you're buried into his death and then raised to, to his new life? So... Uh, it's very, um, you know, we're not coming to Mass on this day to recall a historical event, which admittedly was stupendous, but nonetheless was 2,000 years ago. We are coming to Mass to, to witness the presentation once again of a historical event, which is so remarkable, it fills all time and is always present to us and has been made personally applicable to us through the sacraments where the, the grace unleashed by this act of our Lord Jesus Christ is personally uh, effectuated into me, John Bergsma, by my baptism with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I have been raised with Christ. And then it says, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Um, elsewhere, um, uh, for example, in um, the early chapters of Ephesians, uh, Paul will make it clear that it's not just Christ who's seated at the right hand of God, but we are seated with him that's right. at the right hand of God. And that's, that's a great mystery because we tend to conceive of ourselves in this great, you know, this great battle, which is the human condition 
this, you know, this great spiritual warfare that we're involved in as disciples of Christ. We tend to think of ourselves as down here and the angels and the demons are fighting it out above us. And we have to call on St. Michael to protect us. And we're these little pawns, you know, at the mercy of these powers. But if you read Ephesians, um, you know, drawing on these concepts, Paul says, no, we're not. We're not down here as pawns. We're the body of Christ, and Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and everything's under his feet. Right. So we have authority in Christ. We are full of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to live lives of servitude to the spiritual powers, the powers and principalities that St. Paul mentions in his epistles. We can truly walk in victory. Uh, wow. we, can, we can, especially if we apply, you know, if we... If we uh, believe that this is true, if we place our faith, that that is the fact that we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms, all things are under his feet. In Christ, we have authority over the demonic realm. We do not have to live in servitude to it. We place our faith in that, and then we live by that because faith is perfected by actions. Then we can walk in a state of grace. We don't have to, you know, continually wallow in sin and just hope that you know, the, uh, the snows of God's grace will cover the dunghill of our, of our lives like, Lu like Luther imagined. No, it's possible to make progress in holiness and to make progress in sanctity because of the power that we have in Christ. And we claim and believe that promise that we're seated with him already in the heavenly places. The very fact that you would refer to Luther reminds me, <laughs> as a former Protestant pastor, speaking to a former <laughs> Protestant pastor, you know, how we as evangelical Protestants would wholeheartedly affirm the incarnation, the Word made flesh. We would wholeheartedly affirm the historicity of the gospel accounts of his passion, death, and his resurrection. But generally speaking, we would regard the incarnation and the Paschal mystery as a historical event that is true. But what you just suggested was, this isn't just true back then. It has redefined reality. We have in Christ a new creation. And if we are in Christ, we are part of that new creation. Now you might say, well, that's uh, already not yet, but mostly not yet. That's still almost entirely off in the future. But wait a minute. If we have enough faith to profess the real presence of Christ's resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity, then we ought to have enough faith to reassess our own identity. You know, if what you see is not all you get in the Eucharist, then what we see in the mirror is not all we get either. Mm -hmm. You just reminded us that in Colossians, in Ephesians, but especially in Romans 6, baptism for St. Paul isn't just a sign of the resurrection. It's an effective and powerful sign that causes us to enter into union with the resurrected body of Christ so that Paul would say we are resurrected not like Lazarus was, but much more <laughs> because we're not just getting a mortal body back like he did after four days. We are being inserted. We are being made members of Christ's own divinized humanity. Yeah. We are made members of his body. And as Protestants, we would affirm that as a profound and richly symbolic metaphor. <laughs> but that's metaphor. where it stops. Right. Yes. You know, we would say, yeah, it, it isn't non-metaphorical, but it's not merely metaphorical. It's a sign, but as such, it's pointing us to a reality. It's a mystery, but it's a metaphysical reality like you just indicated. And, and it's like, okay, well, if that's the case, what do we have to rethink? The answer is everything. Yeah. Every part of our lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, so we come to Mass on this Easter Sunday day. And, uh, and you know, we, we know people that are maybe newly baptized exactly. or newly confirmed. And, um, you know, we're willing to say that this piece of bread and this cup of wine, despite appearances, is actually body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. But we have to remember that our friends, our acquaintances, those who went through the sacramental initiation at the Easter Vigil, they've been uh, not exactly transubstantiated, but something analogous has right. occurred to them. Their very nature has been changed. They're recreated, they're regenerated, they're right. a new creation, and right. that isn't a mere metaphor. No, it's not. They may look like our same buddy Joe, you know, who was, right. who, uh, you know, to all appearances, uh, just as he was two days ago, but now he's, his very nature, his interior nature has been changed. He has been transformed into a son of God. And we have to believe that in faith. 
And we have to believe that our friend Joe, who's received sacramental initiation, is really now seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. He's a new creature in Christ, uh, filled with the grace of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered to live a life of holiness. You know, we're really called on to believe that and to act as though it is true. And not as though it's true, but because it's true. You know, so, I, I think what you just said triggered something in my mind that I haven't thought of before. Namely, that when you look at the accounts of the resurrection and the witnesses and the humble testimony that they give, time and again, it must have been hard to admit we didn't recognize him at first. Yeah. You know, Mary Magdalene, where have you hidden him? Where has he gone, you know? Right. And, and likewise, Clopas and his companion on the road to him. You wonder, why, Lord, did you withhold your identity? You know, and it wasn't simply because they were looking down and dejected. It's because Jesus did not want them just to say, hey, wait, man, you look great, you know? <laughs> You've come back from Hades and you're just looking so fit. The, the fact is, he is the same person. It is the same humanity. But the transformation that his own body, blood, soul, and divinity have undergone, his body, blood, and soul at least, is exactly what we undergo. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost the case that the scriptures have to be opened first for Clopas and his companion. And Luke 24 is one of the options for the Sunday afternoon mass this uh -huh. Easter. But the scriptures have to be opened by Christ himself in order for our eyes to be opened in the breaking of the sacramental bread but what you just gestured toward was our eyes have to be open in the breaking of the baptismal resurrection as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. That these people who have come back for mass after they were baptized last night, they are resurrected. You know, mm -hmm. they are in effect restored to life that is divine and eternal. Our first parents had it and they lost it. So when they transmit human life to their offspring, the church in the Catholic tradition, the Catholic tradition says, when you're born with original sin, you're not born depraved, but you are born deprived of the divine life that our first parents had and then forfeited. So we have natural life devoid of supernatural life until baptism, until right. Easter. Then suddenly you realize the resurrection is really ordered not to getting more glory for Jesus because he's God, he can't get it. But it is to download that for us, beginning with the spiritual resurrection to divine life, this baptismal rebirth. Yeah. It's like, you know, it would be absolutely unfitting to have cheerleaders with pom-poms, <laughs> but it would almost take something like that to get through to the heads and the hearts of so many people who are just like, you know, here we are recycling these readings, right. recycling the yeah. sacraments, like yeah. full stop. No. no, what's happening here is too good to be true unless of course it's the gospel truth yeah. and it is. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And Scott, we've talked about, um, you know, how these, t how these readings tie in with baptism, but these, these rich, Eucharistic uh, themes as well, and I can't I can't resist uh, pulling out uh, a, a particularly striking one from our first reading, where um, Saint Peter is preaching mm -hmm. um, in Acts ten. In Acts ten, and and the Gentiles are uh, uncircumcised Gentiles are about to be baptized for the first time, so there is a kind of tie in to baptism without a doubt here. They're about to receive the Holy Spirit and uh, be baptized, and then. As Peter is reciting uh, the, the good news, the kerygma, he talks about being put to death, Jesus being put to death by hanging on a tree. Then God raised him on the third day, granted that he be visible, that's interesting, yeah. not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, and, and the Greek word for witness is martyria or martyres, you know, from which we get martyrs, that's rather striking. Mm -hmm. Witnesses chosen by God advanced, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And that's so beautiful because when we look at the Gospels, Scott, as, as you and I have uh, several times in this particular point, okay, um, our Lord speaks at the Last Supper as though he's not going to eat and drink again until he eats and drinks in the kingdom with the apostles. Right. But then, of course, not only do we see him drinking of the fruit of the vine, which he expressly says he won't do, but we see him doing it with that soured wine at the cross in John 19. So he was not going to do that until the kingdom came. So I argue, and others as well, and I believe you would agree with me, 
He's ushering in the kingdom right there at the cross, and then he's the king, of course. Yeah, he is. He's yes. the kingdom too. He's the kingdom too. And then in Acts, in the early verses of Acts, Acts one, three, and four, we see our Lord. Um, it says sharing salt with the apostles. You got the the, the Greek term precisely right, because so right. often it's translated yes. in a much weaker way. Right, as spending time with them or conversing right. with them or something, but it's taking it's, salt. It's an idiom that refers specifically to sharing a meal with them. Is that an Acts 1-4? Uh, I think it's Acts 1-3, okay. but uh, close enough. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so he's sharing a meal there with them at the beginning of Acts, and that's so significant, just a small line but so significant because the fact that he is the eating and drinking with them uh, now indicates uh, that the kingdom has arrived. And there they ask him, are you going to, at this time to restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, he says to them, it's not uh, yours to know the times and the seasons, but you're going to be my witnesses. There's that word again. Yes. Witnesses, my martyres, my martyrs from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. This is this theological geography of the kingdom of David, uh, Jerusalem being David's capital, Judea his tribe, Samaria his nation, the people of Israel, and then the ends of the earth being the Gentiles who were supposed to be his vassals as his kingdom expanded. Right. So he, he uh, uh, doesn't answer to them when the kingdom is going to be restored to Israel, but he actually tells them how the kingdom is going to be restored to Israel. They are the new Israel. They are the 12 patriarchs of the new Israel, and they're going to be the witnesses that are going to spread this kingdom of Israel uh, all the way to the Gentiles who are David's vassals and therefore owe uh, obedience to Jesus, the son of David, who's uh, the king of the universe here. So, uh, and then Peter is referring to that, we who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, uh, which is an authentic witness to the arrival of the kingdom then. And then when we come to Mass on this Easter day, we are eating and drinking with the resurrected Christ after he rose from the dead. That's what we are doing right. at, uh, at our parishes on this day. And the fact that we're eating with and drinking with the resurrected Christ is proof positive that the kingdom has arrived and that we are living in uh, the kingdom of David, which is manifested in the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church throughout the world. Beautiful. I want to just briefly rewind from Acts 10 back to Acts 1 since you were referring to that, because I can picture Peter taking salt, eating with the resurrected Lord, and you know, hearing about how we'll bear witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But what's this point about waiting? Wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you shall be my witnesses. It's like, aren't we already your witnesses? You know, so on the one hand, Peter could be thinking to himself, we have witnessed you, but others haven't. With all due respect, you know, could you stick around and maybe, you know, show yourself to Pilate, to Caiaphas, to the Sanhedrin, to the crowds who shouted crucify him? I mean, just for the shock and the awe of it, you know? And secondly, why do we have to wait to be your witnesses since we already have witnessed whatever we would testify to? Because apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from the power of this new Pentecost, we can relate empirical events. We can recount what we saw and heard, but we will only be seeing and saying the things that are natural and empirical and human, not the supernatural. Only through the Holy Spirit are you going to be able to testify to the sacred mystery that this is more than a resuscitated corpse. It's more than a historical event. It's more than just his body, his physical body resurrected. Through the breaking of bread in Acts 2, 42 to 46, we're going to be partaking of his resurrected body in Holy Communion. You know, and, and then you, I, the other thing I want to do to bring it all the way around is, again, Acts 10, you described as the Gentile Pentecost. And I think most of our audience might not be familiar with how important it is because this first reading from Acts 10 seems a little random. You know, mm -hmm. Acts 10 for Easter Sunday. Right. You know, but we're Gentiles, and so we ought to get with the program and recognize the fact that if we were to look at this reading in its larger context, you know, this is the last thing on earth that Peter expected. He'd already been preaching, but there he is in Caesarea, or there he is in Joppa, and he has this vision uh, in a trance of the sheet 
coming down from heaven with all of these reptiles, all these animals, all these unclean varmints, and rise, kill, and eat. It's like, look, I might not be a Pharisee, but I've never touched anything unclean, much less consume it. What God has cleansed, you must not call unclean. Three times it had to happen to kind of, you know, hammer through the hard noggin of our first pope, and then finally a knock on the door, and it's like, wait a second, you mean the unclean animals represent the Gentiles who up until now were outside of the covenants of promise? And so I'm going to preach to them. And as you mentioned before we started recording this, it's so significant that the sermon that Peter is preaching leads right up to the baptism of Cornelius, the first Gentile, and the fact that the Holy Spirit comes upon them every bit as much, not like 65% of what they got right. at Pentecost. <laughs> they get it every bit as much, and I think Peter himself was probably stunned more than he would care to admit. But this becomes the basis for Gentiles not just being brought into the church as vassals of the kingdom, but full-fledged sons and daughters and brothers and sisters with our fellow Jews. Indeed, yeah, it's amazing. And the, one of the first to get baptized, probably the first, I don't know if it gives an order in Acts, but Cornelius, he's a Roman centurion, a symbol of Roman society, Roman power. Right. Rome was the capital of the nations, the capital of the Gentiles. And so we have this trajectory in Acts of the gospel going from Jerusalem to Rome. And in principle, it's already accomplished by the time we get to Acts 10. But then, of course, there's a working out as we have further evangelism, we move out and Paul uh, is in Rome itself under house arrest at the end of Acts in Acts 28, preaching the kingdom, which is the very thing that Jesus was teaching about at the beginning of Acts in right. the vicinity of Jerusalem. So we move from the Lord teaching about the kingdom to in Jerusalem to Paul uh, preaching about the kingdom in Rome, and that's the movement of the gospel. And so it continues to this very day as we remain in the Roman Catholic Church, which is... Uh, the, the, the one church big enough to incorporate all the Gentiles into it. <laughs> no, the whole world. <laughs> you know, we started off acknowledging that this stuff is deep, it's profound, it's inexhaustible, and we're running out of time. But let me just say thank you for sharing, because what you have reminded me of is what Mother Church does in every Sunday and feast day. And that is, it's almost like turning Scripture into a symphony where we're hearing the Psalms, we're hearing the Old and the New Testament, we're hearing the promises being fulfilled in a way that goes beyond our wildest dreams. And yet at the same time, it also goes beyond our natural sight. So we have to walk by faith and not by sight. We have to take God at His Word. We have to allow the Scriptures to be opened in the Liturgy of the Word in order for our eyes to be opened in the breaking of the bread. But I just want to conclude with two thoughts. One, Jesus deciding to spend his first day back from the dead with Clopas and his companion in the alternate gospel reading for Sunday afternoon this Easter. You know, I always like to say, you know, if you were our Lord and this was your first day back from the dead, how would you spend it? Well, I would drop into my mother, but Pilate and, Ka and others too. But spending most of the day leading this extensive scripture study, going through the law and the prophets to show that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer before entering into his glory with two apparent nobodies who don't even recognize him. <laughs> Clearly, Jesus prioritizes the importance for ordinary people to understand scripture, not just us professors or converts, you know. Mm -hmm. The second thing I want to do in conclusion is to quote from your commentary in this amazing book that we're always drawing from, The Word of the Lord. On uh, page 213 of the Easter Sunday readings, you say, we note that Jesus' explanation of Scripture made their hearts burn. Would that homilies would still make our hearts burn. But to, for that to happen, we need to teach the Scriptures in seminaries in a different way than they have been taught for generations. We don't feel strongly about that, do we? Not at all. <laughs> oh, that will like, motivate anything that we do. Right. In <laughs> seminaries, in colleges, in high schools, and in families as well. I mean, I have to believe that this is why we enjoy working together, but also why the Lord has called the St. Paul Center and why he's asked us to do this program, The Word of the Lord. And I, I say this knowing that we're going to be putting this out there. Uh, I know that ordinarily you have to subscribe to see The Word of the Lord, but just as Christ has lavished himself so freely in us, we want to make this available so that as many people can see what happens when the word of the Lord is connected to the Eucharist. And all of that is made part of the resurrection. 
So 10,000 thanks for the, for the remarkable, the exciting exposition. Um, my heart was burning our, this entire half hour. But at the same time, I want to thank all of you for joining us together. And I invite you to spread the word to your family members, friends, and fellow parishioners so that we might share the word of the Lord together again next week and for months and years to come. Until then, thank you again, and may the Lord richly bless you. Hallelujah. Christ is risen indeed.